I'd like to call the meeting to order at 4 p.m. and announce that the board will meet in closed session to address items one through four. At this time, I'd like to call on public comment on any of the closed session items. No comments. I'd like to close the public comment and we will recess into closed session. Thank you.
I'd like to call the meeting to order and announce that the board met in closed session and the following action was taken. It's 6.09 p.m. During closed session, the board held a hearing and made the determination that employee number 138611 shall remain on paid suspension and participate in the panel examination process defined in Ed Code Section 44942. In closed session, the board voted in favor of this action unanimously. Item number two, in closed session, the board took action regarding the superintendent's appointment of Chad Switzerler to the position of assistant superintendent of schools as secretary. This appointment requires board approval of assistant of superintendents of schools and the secondary position employment agreement during the open session portion of the September 6, 2022 regular board meeting and the vote was unanimous. Item number three, government code section 54957, public employee discipline dismissal release complaint. The board voted to adopt a hearing officer's proposed decision upholding the proposed demotion of a classified employee in the classification of physical technician one, and the vote was unanimous. Good evening and welcome to the Elk Grove Unified School District's Board of Education meeting. Unless otherwise ordered by the Sacramento Public Health Department, the state or by other legal mandate, including AB 361 board resolution, the Board of Education has resumed full in-person meetings. Live streaming of the full in-person board meetings will be available via the Zoom platform. Today's meeting is being video recorded and will be available on the district's YouTube channel. Public comment information, there will be one public comment period during each regular board meeting after the board recognitions that will include both items on the district's jurisdiction, but not on the board meeting agenda and the public comments on items on the board meeting agenda. Public comment guidelines for the in-person public comments and participation can be out, found outside the boardroom on the, and on the district's website. I'd like to start off with our first item, which is the Pledge of Allegiance from Mary Sugimoto Elementary School. And at this time, I'd like to call on Mrs. Maria Maderos and Principal Molly Sangaline. And um, there will be some words read by Mrs. Beth Albiani. Do I read first? Mary Sukamoto Elementary School is honored to recognize Maria Medeiros as our education partner. Ms. Medeiros is the proud mother of Ellie, a second grade student at Mary Sukamoto and three other children, Anthony, James, and Desiree. <laughs> Desiree, previous students at the school. Ms. Medeiros has worked hard to improve the lives of students at Mary Sukamoto Elementary School for the past 17 years as an active member of the PTO. Maria works tirelessly for the community and is always available in any capacity to support our students and families. She is so dedicated to the Sukamoto community that she continued to serve as the PTO president even when she had no students enrolled at school. She is an integral part of all school events and has helped the school raise money through various fundraising efforts, including the dunk tank event that is coming up next week. Ms. Medeiros is truly a treasure and Mary Sukamoto Elementary is grateful and fortunate to have had such a dedicated parent and family as a partner. For years, Ms. Medeiros has shared her heart with our Sukamoto Sharks and it is an honor for us to celebrate her this evening. Thank you for all you do. When you lead the pledge and then I'd like to come down and give you a small gift and take a picture afterwards, okay?
Maybe there was an ID given since we have so much of the school site staff. Maybe we could do a photo at some point over here with the school site staff as well. Anyone who'd like to join right there? <laughs> if anyone wants to join, you're welcome from the school site. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. The next item on our agenda is a presentation and recommendation or recognition. It's a recommendation to name the multi-purpose room building at Mary Sugimoto Elementary School. I believe there are no Zoom comments for this item. Are there any blue cards for this item? Ma'am Board President, there's no blue card. I'd like to call on Mr. Pierce to present. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Hopp and Ms. Avalos. Um, if it pleases the board tonight, I'm also gonna be joined by Molly Sangalang, who's the principal at Mary Sukamoto, as well as Charlie Henderson, who's been a longtime teacher at Sukamoto, and they're here with me this evening. Um, I do wanna say it's pure 100% coincidence that they have the honorary flag salute tonight, as well as this momentous occasion, so that sometimes things work out perfectly. Um, thank you for hearing the item tonight. Consistent with board policy and administrative regulation 7511, community and staff members at Mary Sukamoto Elementary School have requested to name their multi-purpose room. Administration, as well as Elizabeth Pinkerton, who's the community advisor on school facility names, all support the recommendation that's before the board tonight, again, consistent with your policy. Mary Sukamoto Elementary School has benefited from having an outstanding individually both professionally and personally on their faculty for the last 17 years. This individual was Mike Hadler. He was a beloved custodian at Sukamoto Elementary School for 17 years. During his years of dedication, he left an indelible mark on all the students, all of the colleagues and the community of the school. For the entire time he worked there, his passion for the school, its staff and its students were evident in everything that he did. Sadly, on the evening of February 17th, 2022, Mary Sukamoto Elementary School lost its beloved custodian and friend, and Mr. Hadler sadly and unexpectedly passed away in his sleep just days before his 60th birthday. The loss of Mr. Hadler has left the school staff and community with a desire to honor his service, his commitment, and his dedication in this lasting manner. Due to Mr. Hadler's unfaltering patience, his kindness, for all students and staff during his tenure. The staff and the community have requested to name the multi-purpose room in his honor. More than 400 individuals signed the request um, that was submitted to myself and Superintendent Hoffman in order to ensure that there's a permanent way to show their respect for Mr. Hadler and display his impact at Mary Sukamoto Elementary School for generations to come. In short, Mr. Hadler was one of the good people in the world. He was a model employee by any measure. He was actually an employee and a custodian throughout for 29 years. Again, 17 of those years being at Mary Sukamoto Elementary School. He was an ambassador for the school and greeted everyone who stepped on campus in a way that always made them feel welcome. He loved his job and the people he served and in return, they loved him. 
Again, he was an extremely dedicated, kind person and treated all with respect and was always willing to help and do whatever was asked of him. Several Sukamoto staff have noted that they can't go into the multipurpose room without thinking of him. Mr. Hadler's presence in the multipurpose room was a stable for the school. It was known as his space where his office was also located and he took great pride in the fact that the multipurpose room was the space where the whole school would come together to unite, to assemble, and to eat. Speaking with me again tonight will be Mo Molly Sangalang, the principal, and I'm gonna turn it over to her. Good evening, Superintendent Hoffman and members of the board. Thank you for making the time to hear our request this evening. I would like to share remarks on behalf of our staff and formal, former principals, Jana Vermette and Elizabeth Ruda. Mike Hadler was not only a dependable lead custodian for 17 years, he was so much more. All who knew Mike came to know him as a friend to all students and staff members alike, an extremely hard worker and an amazing human with the softest heart. Yes, he was a strong custodian, but those words do not even begin to encompass what he was to our staff. Mike was the guy who would unload your car before you asked. He was the kind voice who responded immediately to a radio call and would drop whatever he was doing to help where needed. Mike was humble and quiet, yet confident and capable. You would never hear Mike complain. He did whatever what was needed and always a little bit more. Mike hated to ever miss a day of work and we all knew Mike would never let us down. His unfaltering patience, kindness, and helpfulness to all during his 17 years at Mary Sukumoto was a true expression of Mike's love. He loved the school. When speaking with staff about Mike, the responses are unanimous. To this day, when walking into the multi-purpose room, Mike's presence is felt. There is no better way to recognize his service to our district and our school than to rename our multi-purpose room in his honor. It was his space, it was his home, and Mary Sukumoto Elementary was his family. Please allow us to share Mike Hadler's legacy for generations to come. Thank you. Charlie Henderson will also speak. So you've heard um, Mrs. Sang Lang speak of how much Mike loved the school, the staff and the students, and Molly also spoke about how much Mike was loved and returned by the entire school community. I'm gonna talk about how the students learned from Mike. You see, the morning of Mike's passing, the students in my class sensed something was wrong on campus. So, unfortunately, I had the role of, of bringing that news to them. I was supported by Vice Principal Kathy Brink and Principal Jennifer met. We also had two mental health professionals from the district. And we explained Mike's passing to the students and allowed them the opportunity to share their memories and their special moments with Mike. But the students learned from Mike and I didn't know that until the time was over. And of course, the administrators and the mental health professionals had to move on to the next classroom. And I was left with a classroom of sixth graders still with tears in their eyes. And I looked at my schedule and said, Henderson, read the room. It's not gonna be math next. Well, I said, we need to get outside and get some fresh air, hoping that they could maybe debrief with each other. So we walked out, the track is close to my classroom. And I said, let's go out and get some fresh air before we move on with our day. And I looked down and I, I needed to text my wife to let her know how it had gone because I'd already called her in tears on the way uh, to school because I had learned about it while I was at Starbucks. Um, I look up my, from my phone and a good third of my class are out on the track, on the field, on the blacktop, picking up trash and it hit me that they had they had learned from mike the morals the ethics the dedication to their school so i called them together and i said guys there's no better way you could honor the man than doing what you've seen him do for your entire time here at sukumoto 
you're doing his job. Um, and of course, there were more tears. And I thank you for this opportunity. Um, and um, hopefully, we can get the MP named after him. He deserves it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so again, it is the desire of the Mary Sukamoto Elementary School community and staff that the multipurpose room be dedicated to Mike Hadler with signage that demonstrates the school's appreciation for his countless contributions and commitment. And I would be remiss, and I think people would be upset. I'm a diehard Giants fan, but I understand if there's one thing that he loved more than that school, or at least equally, are the Dodgers. And that's why he's got a baseball tie on. He refused to wear a Dodgers jersey because he's a NorCal fan too. But um, I know that it's important to many people who loved him um, that people are aware of that. Go down. I know where this is going. <laughs> I did want to share that. So this is up for your consideration and we would appreciate your support and your vote. Thank you for sharing. Uh, those memories are so um, important, I know, to the community. Um, at this time, I'd like to call for a motion to approve the request for Mary Sukumoto Elementary School staff and community to name the multi-purpose room at Mary Sukumoto Elementary School, the Mike Hadler multi-purpose room. So moved. I have a first second. and a second, and we will conduct a roll call vote. Mr. Track? Aye. Mr. Forcina? Aye. Ms. Chaitis Espinoza? Aye. Ms. Albiani? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. And myself is an aye. It's unanimous. Thank you. The next item we have on the agenda is resolutions. The first item is the Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Are there any Zoom comments on this item? I don't believe so. Right, okay. Are there any blue cards on this item? And Board President, no blue card on this item. I'd like to call on Katie Thomas. Good evening, Madam President, Mr. Track, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Avalos. It is my pleasure tonight to ask that you approve and adopt resolution number nine, recognizing the month of September as Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, and although suicide prevention is important to address year round, Suicide Prevention Awareness Month is a dedicated time for us to work together and act to reduce stigma, encourage help seeking, connect individuals with suicide ideation to services, and to reduce the impact of suicide on family and friends. Suicide is a preventable health problem, and yet the CDC reports it as the second leading cause of death among young people ages 10 to 24. And the suicide rate in the United States has increased by 35% since 1999. The stigma associated with mental health conditions and suicidality work against suicide prevention by discouraging the people at risk from life seeking life-saving support. By recognizing Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, the district is shedding light on this topic and is dedicated to educating and encouraging students, staff, and families to recognize the warning signs of suicide and guide those in need to appropriate services and support. While the district has communicated the importance of suicide awareness in the district parent student handbook, through school messages and on ID cards, this resolution memorializes the district's intent to further amplify the importance of suicide awareness and build an annual public awareness campaign on the support and services we have available to our students and family. Again, I ask the board adopt resolution number nine, recognizing the month of September as Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to call for a motion to adopt resolution number nine, recognizing the month of September, Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. So moved, Madam Chair. I second it. I have a first and a second. I will conduct a roll call vote. Mr. Track? Aye. Ms. Chaitis Espinoza? Aye. 
Albiani. Aye. Ms. Richardson. Aye. Ms. Jamerson. Aye. Mr. Perez. Aye. Mr. Forcina. Aye. And myself is an aye. It's unanimous. Thank you. The next item up is citizenship and civic learning. I'd like to call on any Zoom comments. I don't believe there's any. And then any blue cards on the item? No, okay. blue like card on this item. Thank you. I'd like to call on Ms. Darnell Black. Thank you. I was so excited. I started running up here as soon as I knew it was my turn. <laughs> Good evening, Madam President, Dr. Martinez Alier, members of the board, Mr. Track, welcome, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Avalos. I'm here to request the adoption of resolution number eight, citizenship and civic learning. It's the goal of the Elk Grove Unified School District to prepare all of our students for success in college career and civic life. Schools are a critical place for students to develop the civic knowledge, skills, and values needed to effectively participate in our democracy by having classroom instruction in government, history, law, and democracy, discussion of current events, service learning, extracurricular and co-curricular activities, student voice in school governance, and simulations of the democratic process. Students who engage in the community and participate in civic action gain knowledge about schools, local and global issues, and are prepared to succeed in college, career, and life. Beginning with the class of 2023, 12th grade students in the Elk Grove Unified School District will be eligible to earn the California State Seal of Civic Engagement, which was established to encourage and create pathways for students to become civically engaged in democratic governmental institutions at the local, state, and national level. To earn the state seal of civic engagement, students must be engaged in academic work in a productive way, demonstrate an understanding of the US and California Constitution, functions and governance of local governments, tribal government structures, the role of the citizen in a constitutional democracy, the democratic principles, concepts, and processes. They must also participate in one or more informed civic engagement projects, like being the student board member, <laughs> that address real world problems and require students to identify and inquire into civic needs or problems, considered varied responses and reflect on their efforts. They must also demonstrate their civic knowledge, skills and dispositions through self-reflection and exhibit character traits that reflect civic mindedness and a commitment to positively impact the classroom, school, community and society. In support of this resolution, the Curriculum and Professional Learning Department will facilitate a four-part book study for teachers on the book, The Civically Engaged Classroom, Reading, Writing, and Speaking for Change. That will start in September. I humbly request that the Board of Education adopt resolution number nine, Citizenship and Civic Learning. This time, I'd like to call for a motion to adopt the resolution on citizenship and civic learning as presented. So moved. I have a first. Do I have a second? I'll second, Madam Chair. I have a second. And I'd like to conduct a roll call vote. Mr. Track? Aye. Ms. Albiani? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. Forcina? Aye. Ms. Chaitis Espinosa? Aye. And myself is an aye. It's unanimous. It's been approved. The next item is item number three, the Constitution Day. And I believe there are no Zoom public comments for this item, and there's also no blue cards for public comment on this item. So I'd like to call on Mrs. Black again. All right, so I am here to request the adoption of resolution number 10, designating September 17th, 2022 as Constitution Day. September 17th, 2022 will be the 235th anniversary of the formation and signing of the Constitution of the United States of America. The finalizing of the Constitution had taken place after months of deliberation and discussion. It'd be many more months before it was ratified by the states, which happened in 1789. The Constitution that still governs and guides our country today has had significant political influence around the world. The values and beliefs that are represented in the document are ones in which citizens of our country should be familiar with. In 2004, Congress created a federal holiday, Constitution Day, 
and designated it as September 17th. In May of 2005, the U.S. Department of Education stipulated that all schools that receive right. federal funds must hold educational programs pertaining to the U.S. Constitution on September 17th of each year. Through this resolution, the Board of Education would communicate a clear message about the importance of our country's foundational governing document, as well as the importance of civic values. In support of this resolution, and in recognition of, recognition of Constitution Day, the Curriculum and Professional Learning Department will offer an educator workshop titled Defining Citizenship, the 14th Amendment, on Monday, September 19th, 2022. Additionally, school sites will receive information and resources for observing Constitution Day at their sites. I request that the Board of Education adopt resolution number 10, designating September 17th as Constitution Day. At this time, I'd like to call for a motion to adopt resolution number 10, designating September 17, 2022 as Constitution Day. I move approval of resolution number 10. Second. I have a first and a second. Conduct a roll call vote. Mr. Trapp? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. Forcina? Aye. Ms. Travis Espinoza? Aye. Ms. Albiani? Aye. And myself is an aye, is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is public comment. I believe there are no Zoom public comments for items um, on the agenda. Is that correct, Ms. Soriano? Yes. Madam Board President Marta Martinez Larry, that is correct. There are no Zoom comments. So at this time, I'd like to call on Mr. Yang to see if there's um, any blue card for items on the agenda. Madam Chair, we have one blue card on the agenda. Call on Mike Dawson. Good evening, board. Uh, my name is Mike Dobson. I'm uh, the Recreation and Community Services Director with Kasumna CSD. Uh, I'm just here tonight to speak uh, very much in favor of uh, our longstanding partnership and um, I guess, what is it, item 11 on the agenda with the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program. Um, so with that competitive RFP, um, we did submit for it and uh, looks like we will be uh, overseeing three sites. So we're very excited about um, this opportunity, uh, we have a long-standing positive relationship um, with uh, Chris Hoffman, Rob Pierce, many members of, of, the, of the school district um, where we've worked collaboratively in the past. So we're just very excited to continue this collaboration and, and to grow both our agencies kind of lockstep together in providing this type of service for the community. So thank you guys. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is public comment for items not on the agenda. I do not, are there any uh, Zoom public comments? Madam Board President Martin Clary, there are no Zoom comments. Do we have any, I'd like to call Mr. Yang for any blue cards on the items not on the agenda? Madam Chair, we do have one blue card. Calling on John Shorts. So good evening, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I am simply a concerned parent uh, tonight. I have um, three daughters in the school district, one at Kazumas Oaks, one at Pinkerton, and one in the PALS program at uh, John Earhart Elementary School. And uh, I just appreciate the time. I wanted to take just a couple of minutes just to share my heart a little bit. Um, my oldest daughter uh, at Kazumas Oaks, we had a bit of a scare last year, a bit of a scare, a, a pretty big scare for a few minutes. Um, it was fall of last year when uh, I got a text from my daughter that um, there was a, a lockdown at the school and a possible active shooter. I opened my life, I, I never feel that feeling that I felt in those few minutes, just, just for a few minutes, um, and I hope none of any of us in this room ever experienced that, that fear. Um, you know, that's the world we live in now. And, and I don't know that there are 
answers or there are ways to address um, and there are ways to take precautions. There are things that we can do. Uh, but it, it, it is also something that uh, I, I would greatly appreciate hearing and, and knowing that the school district is taking steps and having discussions about how to keep our schools safe. Um, also about safety and in a, in a different note, uh, you know, we recently were getting uh, emails now as parents, uh, schools are getting back to go, they're preparing us as parents uh, for kids to get back and, and just things to be aware of. And one of the emails that we got that was concerning for us was uh, there are now gonna be um, feminine products that are gonna be kept in the men's restroom, in the boys' restroom. Now that's an issue and I have no desire to get political here tonight. And I know that there's a lot going on that's out of our hands. There are issues being legislated and being put into law that I understand that you and we all have to adjust to. But I was just worried for the safety for my kid. My daughter is autistic and she isn't gonna know if somebody comes into the restroom to try to take advantage of her. That is, uh, again, I don't know what you do. I, I don't know what you do to take precautions, but I would like to know that discussions are happening on how to keep our kids safe in ways that we've never had to think about before. I just hope that you all are valuing and talking about and fighting for the safety of our kids. I hope that that's just a greater value for you all than anything else that comes into your mind. And I, I just come to you tonight. I just hope I just hope to express my concern. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That ends our blue card for this item. Thank you. We could have the appropriate staff member follow up. The next item on the agenda is consent agenda. Uh, Madam President, before we uh, take a motion for consent agenda, I'd like to read a statement. Consistent with Education Code Section 35107E of Board Policy 9270 regarding the employment of relatives, I'm abstaining from any discussion and action tonight regarding the consent calendar. At this time, I'd like to call on the consent agenda action and call for a motion to approve items one through 20 on the consent agenda. And I do see a hand over here by Mr. Perez. Um, I'd like to pull items up. Number eight and 11. I had uh, spoke to our uh, Superintendent Hoffman earlier today, and um, and I still want to bring out some issues on 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 our consent calendar items number eight and eleven. So I'd like to call for a motion to approve all other items one through twenty, with the exception of number eight and eleven. So moved. First by Ms. Albiani. Do I have a second? I'll second, Madam Chair. I have a second by Ms. Chaitis as Minoza. Conduct a roll call vote. Mr. Track? Aye. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. First, or, sorry, excuse me. Ms. Chaitis as Minoza? Aye. Ms. Albiani? Aye. And Mr. Yang? Aye. And myself as an aye. As stated, uh, Mr. Forcino will be abstaining. So the next item, I'll go back to Mr. Press. The first item he pulled was item number eight, which is the 2022-2023 budget revisions. Um, Ms. Hayes, <laughs> me again. Uh, looks like we uh, are gonna receive uh, 60,000, no, 60 million, 837, 100,000. $369, that's what this, this states, correct? And as a result of, of the budget changes, and we talked about this at our last meeting, and this is the amount of money that we we were we, we anticipating get, receiving, correct? This is a portion of the funds that we're anticipating. Is, is it the last part of it? I, I thought it was gonna be, well, we received a whole bunch 
that you reported last week, but I thought this was the final for this fiscal year. No, this no. is just the beginning. Okay. So later tonight, um, during the budget update portion, uh -huh. I will go over all of the elements that I think will be coming to outgrowth. Uh -huh. This is just one portion that we were able to add to our budget. The other monies were not able to add to the budget yet. So when the state enacted their budget, there were pieces and parts that are not embedded in ed code yet right. and we don't have accounts to place the funding in so that's the part that we're working on we know an estimate right now of how much elk grove will receive but the portion that you're seeing is the budget transfer uh -huh. or budget revision excuse me is directly related to the lcff okay right that's what i thought this is all lcff that's correct and, and uh, i may have missed it was this going to be reported in your presentation also this this monies this this funding yes these monies that you see here that we're recognizing as new revenue is going to be discussed as part of my presentation okay i, will, I must have missed that then. all right thank you very much um yeah, okay number 11 um uh, that was a good report but i was wondering uh, when are we going to receive the actual amounts that these schools are going to receive and this I'm okay the title approval to award rfp this is number 11 i'm speaking yeah, mr about. pierce i think it's coming up expanded learning opportunity program multiple sites uh, i'm i'm happy to see that receiving a lot of these uh, schools are receiving monies, but when are we going to actually see the total amounts per school? So the, the funding is coming, Mr. Perez, to the district, uh -huh. and then we're administering various ELOP programs at, at multiple school sites. Uh, this is for one particular component of our ELOP right. um, at these specific school sites. Uh -huh. So this will be um, services provided to our students. Mr. Dobson from the Community um, Services District spoke to this earlier. They're being awarded three of these sites to provide these services. So this is one of a multitude of different services that will be provided to our students through our ELOP. So we, you'll be... You, you know, I don't want to speak for Mr. Cerruti or Ms. Sipes, uh -huh. um, but the board will be getting reports on the ELOP and how it's being expended and, and what services are being provided to our students. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call for a motion at this time to approve items number eight and number 11. So moved. A motion, do I have second. a second? Second by Mr. Yank, and I'll conduct a roll call vote. Mr. Track. Aye. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Ms. Travis Espinoza? Aye. Ms. Albiani? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. And myself is an aye. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the budget update for 2022-2023. I'd like to call on Mrs. Hayes. Mr. Pierce is gonna do me a favor and run my presentation. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Davalos. Tonight, um, I'm very, very excited to bring to you the changes that are proposed to Elk Grove Unified on behalf of the state enacted budget. So tonight we're gonna to talk about competitive one-time grants, ongoing and one-time entitlements, changes to our local control funding formula, and then budgeting for the 22-23 school year and what's coming up in, as far as next steps. So I wanna make sure that terminology is clear before I start talking. Um, we have grants, which means you have to apply for, it's a competitive process, and it's special funding that has very specific rules of engagement. Entitlements mean just because we are a school district serving students in grades TK through 12, 
we are entitled to receive funding where we don't have to apply for it on a competitive basis. However, there's still rules and regulations and reporting that goes along with it. So the ones we're gonna talk about here are funded on a one-time basis. They total $1.8 million. They are all competitive in nature and they all have um, stipulations that go with them. The first one we're gonna talk about is the Golden State Pathways Program. The state enacted budget includes $500 million one time over a seven year period for a new um, competitive grant. This is to support the development of career pathway programs for critical need jobs, a pathway program focused on technology, healthcare, education, and climate related fields. And programs are predicated on developing local partnerships that bring together school systems, higher education institutions, employers, and other relevant community stakeholders. Now this money, because it is new to the Budget Act, there is not a criteria yet on what the application will look like. And they did not estimate how much a um, school district could receive for this program. So right now, funding is unknown <coughs> for Elk Grove. Then we move to dual enrollment. The enacted budget includes one time $200 million to be spent over a five year period to expand dual enrollment planning and implementation opportunities. Dual enrollment allows high school students to take classes that count towards high school graduation and college credit. Elk Grove could apply for grants up to $350,000, again, through a competitive process. So that what that means is we could apply for $250,000 to support startup and planning costs for middle college or early college high schools. We could also apply for $100,000 to establish a career, college and career access pathway dual enrollment partnership. The grant application themselves will have um, high priority given to districts that have a 50% or more UPP. We qualify there. A higher than average dropout rate, a higher than average rate of suspension and expulsion, a higher than average rate of child homelessness, foster youth, or justice involved youth, and a lower than average rate of pupils completing all A to G courses required to be eligible for admission to the University of California or California State Universities. The next one is not new to the state budget, but it has a new component. It is the Workforce Investment Educator Grant Program. This teacher residency program for the 22-23 school year provides $184 million to the CTC, so this does not come directly to schools. It wants, it's going to recognize school counselors as a high need credential area and establishes school counselor preparation programs. In order to receive this funding, the district would need to match in both in-kind and monetarily 80% of funds awarded. So this program is not free. The second component is a literacy coaches and reading specialist grant program. So for 22-23, there's an investment of 250 million one time available through June of 2027, specific to early literacy and high needs schools. The district may opt out by notifying CDE by September 30th of 22. The CDE will determine allocations based on a district's 2021-22 K-3 enrollment data. And a high need school is considered to be an elementary school with the UPP, that's our unduplicated pupil percentage of 97% or higher in grades K through three. Right now, looking at our 21-22 CalPads information, we have three schools that could potentially qualify that would total an amount of $1,350,000. The next one is the Anti-Bias Education Grant Program. The purpose of the program is to prevent, address, and eliminate racism and bias in public schools. 
Districts could receive up to $200,000 in grants, which are available to use between the 22-23 and 25-26 school years for the following activities. Professional development for classroom management techniques, policies, practices, and procedures, diversity planning, increasing staff diversity, curriculum on topics that address bigotry, racism, or any form of bias or prejudice, and pupil-initiated efforts, supporting student efforts to combat hate, bigotry, racism, or any form of bias or prejudice. The intent to fund the um, awards would be posted by the CDE by November 4th, and Elk Grove could receive a minimum of $75,000 if awarded. Next, we're gonna to move to one-time and ongoing entitlements. So Mr. Prez, to your question earlier, this is where you're gonna see the other money. So one time we anticipate receiving $108.5 million. It's huge money for us. That's a district amount, not a statewide amount. And then ongoing $33 million. <laughs> one time, one one hundred eight point five. The monies I mentioned earlier was part of that. This is on top of the sixty. Oh, it's top. Some more. Mm -hmm. Ooh. <laughs> so the first um, monies we have here, these are ongoing. It's the expanded learning opportunities program funding. We call it ELOP. It's based on our per pupil amount. It's, excuse me, it's based on a per pupil amount times our TK through sixth grade only ADA multiplied by our unduplicated pupil percentage or UPP gets us the amount. This one has been one we've been watching. We, it was introduced shortly thereafter the federal version of expanded learning opportunities. This is the state's version. It is the sister program for our ACES and 21st century learning center funds that we receive. And we didn't think we would participate because the, high, the first priority is to fund schools that have a UPP of 75% or more. However, in fiscal year 21-22, our district did receive about $11 million. Why I mention that is the rate per pupil that districts can receive, if you're over 75%, is $2,750. And that's in statute, and that doesn't change. As enrollment fluctuates and they roll these monies out, the pot is the pot. So why that's important is for a district like ours, where we are below the 75%, the amount of money left that's distributed for all other districts this year for 22-23 is estimated at $2,025 per student. And that's estimated for us to receive 31 million. These monies are restricted. They have a very specific purpose. They have reporting requirements. And so we can't use this money for anything other than an expanded learning opportunity program. Then we're gonna switch gears to transitional kindergarten. Um, as we went through the budget process for the last couple of years, it's been the priority of the governor to ensure that we have um, programs for our early learners. He has instituted a transitional kindergarten grade span adjustment to be added to the local control funding formula. This $2,813 per ADA begins with April of 2023 ADA. It's called our uh, period two. Right now, based on the number of TK enrolled students, um, using an attendance factor of about 91%, meaning that all of the TK students attend 91% of the time, our district could receive up to $2 million. 
So as these numbers are refined going forward, we will update our local control funding formula and they will be adjusted based on our actual P2 ADA in April. These monies are going to be directly supporting the smaller class sizes. So transitional kindergarten in the 21-22 school year had a class size of 24 to 1. This year the class size is still 24, but now you have to have two adults. So you have a student to adult ratio of 1 to 12. TK staffing requirements effective July 1 of 2022. TK classrooms must be staffed with one adult for every 12 kids. As we go into the 23-24, they will um, drop that ratio down to one adult for every 10 students. Ed code requires a credentialed teacher and the permit and permits another adult to make up that ratio. TK is considered an extension of kindergarten, therefore kindergarten credentialing requirements apply. There are two provisions for existing teachers. Um, if they don't have the appropriate early childhood credential, they can get it. Um, so we have some teachers that were grandfathered in prior to 2015. And then there's a grace period for teachers that don't have a child development teaching permit to achieve one. So another large grant is the Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant. This is $8 billion statewide to assist schools and county offices and charter schools with long-term recovery from COVID-19 pandemic. The funds themselves will be distributed based on our prior year second principal apportionment multiplied by our 21-22 UPP. We must report interim expenditures by December of 2024, then again in December of 2027, with the final expenditure report in 2029. Funds, we get to use them all the way through the 27-28 school year, and Elk Grove is estimated to receive approximately $71 million. The funds through the Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant can be used on the following to increase or stabilize instructional learning, decrease or stabilize staff to pupil ratios, close learning gaps, pupil supports to address other barriers to learning, instruction for credit deficient students and other additional academic services. This is very much like the COVID relief funds that we received. Um, these monies actually reside at the county treasury. And so they're not going back into Prop 98 and being redistributed. Why that's important? The way we spend those monies is very, very, very specific. So when we fill out the reports, those bullets you see there, that's all there is. So at some point we will probably come back to the board, not we probably, we will come back to the board with a plan of how to use those monies. Most likely um, this could be used to extend the current um, COVID relief ESSER 3 plan for a couple of years. Then we have the arts, music and instructional materials discretionary block grant. The enacted budget added $3.6 billion one time to create the arts, music, and instructional materials discretionary block grant. The governing board of a school district must discuss and approve a plan for expenditure of the funds at a regularly scheduled public meeting. Funds will be allocated on a per pupil basis using again, prior year 21-22, second principal apportionment ADA, and the funds may be expended through the school year 2025-26. It's estimated that outgrow through this plan will receive 37.5 million. Again, one time. The funds must be used on the following. Instructional materials and professional development aligned to best practices for improving school climate, digital literacy, physical education, and learning through play. Standards aligned professional development and instructional materials 
diverse book collections and culturally relevant texts in English, pupil tone languages or combination of languages, other operational costs, and I wanna pause there. This is what makes this discretionary. So when they say operational costs, that could mean anything to run the district. So health and welfare cost increases, retirement cost increases for the district. It's pretty open-ended in that particular category. And then additional funds could be spent on COVID pandemic related supplies. And so that would be the PPE um, cleaning supplies. Then we come to the local control funding formula. This is the $60 million that we estimate right now on a different, on a number of different um, criteria and formulas for our district. If you recall, I think the last time I was here, I was talking about the, the differences in the way that we can calculate our funded ADA. Um, I think this is a more conservative approach. That way, if we get too far out and our enrollment's not growing or something else changes, we don't have ourselves in a, in a position where we have to reduce revenue. So looking at the LCFF, the 6.56% COLA, which is the bottom portion of the colored bar, this was a statutory COLA amount of 6.56%. This is a very, very high number. The cost of living adjustment, statutory COLA we had for 21-22 was not over 6%. The state will not be able to maintain giving schools a cost of living adjustment amount this high for long periods of time. In a normal pre-COVID environment, we would not see as a school district a cost of living adjustment above two and a half percent. We saw it creep up to about 2.84. We saw it creep up over three. We had a super cola in between. So this year we're funded with a 6.56% cost of living adjustment. It is ongoing and it has been applied to the base amounts per pupil within the LCFF. So it's locked in, in other words, for the school year 22, 23 and going forward, unless the state does something different to reduce that amount per pupil. They will. Then looking at the enacted budget, there was another investment of $4.32 billion statewide intended to help school districts and charter schools address the ongoing fiscal pressures, staffing shortages, and other operational needs. The 6.28% is on top of the cost of living adjustment, also applied to the base rates per ADA. This will generate an ongoing amount of $37.3 million going forward. I'm sorry, I skipped the slide. There we go. Another component of the LCFF that existing ed code was changed, not part of this slide, but we need to talk about it because it plays into this slide. Original ed code stated, in order to be have a funded ADA, you could always use your prior year or your current year, whichever one was greater. Ed code has changed, language was changed to say, it's the same prior year or current year, whichever is greater, or three, the average of the most three recent years. So that's new. Um, when we did the math for our school district, um, we used a three-year rolling average for enrollment, and we also used the equivalent of a three-year rolling average for ADA. So when I brought the budget for approval back at the end of June, that was the basis for the calculation. That was what drove the revenue in the LCFF. This particular calculation allows you to use your attendance yield or your percentage rate of attendance, apply that to your 21-22 CBEDS enrollment, 
to come up with a revised ADA amount for 21-22. Then it will allow you to use a three-year average to come up with your funded ADA. So for our school district, we are revising our LCFF calculation to record 60,301 ADA using that attendance yield factor. Now, that may not be the case going forward. There's a bunch of caveats with that. So in order for us to use that 60,381, we have to self-certify that we met some basic um, needs when it comes to independent study program. We also have an, uh, an enrollment variance. We've seen a huge increase with our kinder and TK enrollment numbers. If our enrollment increases, we may not need to exercise this calculation either. But right now, based on where we're at today, we're gonna use the 60,381 exercising the COVID relief mitigation ADA factor. It's essentially going from 91% and we're using 95% in order to calculate ADA for 21-22 school year. By doing that, the district will receive an additional $14 million going forward. This we're treating as one time in our budget currently until we know what enrollment's gonna look like um, on CBEDS day and what's the best place for the district to be. Then home to school transportation. Elk Grove's home to school transportation add-on right now is $3.2 million. Funding for home to school has increased statewide $637 million ongoing. So although a component of the LCFF, it is an add-on. The caveat to receive this money is that the governing board of the school district must adopt a plan by April 1 of 2023, and it must be updated annually. And it must be developed in consultation with staff, regional transit authorities, local air pollution control districts, and air quality management districts, parents, and students. The plan must be priority for services to students in grades TK through six and low income students. We must describe how transportation will be accessible to students with disabilities and homeless youth. And we have to describe how unduplicated students may access free transportation. The calculation for our district would generate an additional $9.7 million on top of the 3.2 million the district already receives as an add-on. This we're estimated that will be ongoing. We do know that um, this particular uh, add-on will be subject to any cost of living adjustments going forward, but it's not um, based on your ADA, it's based on actual costs. So we just talked a whole lot about the LCFF, so I tried to sum it up here. Um, the new revenue projected um, for the additional 6.28% is 37.3 million. New revenue for the attendance yield adjustment is another 14 million. And then new revenue for the transportation add-on is another 9.7 million. For a total of $61 million in new revenues, which calculates a per ADA amount of 11,498 times our projected ADA of 60,561 for a total LCFF, so this would be base and supplemental, of 6,096, no, $696,332,818. So next steps. Um, this particular budgeting cycle is not gonna be normal. From the perspective, there's a lot of interests. There's a lot of one-time funding sources, fueling ongoing costs. Um, one of those is the Elementary and Secondary Emergency Relief or ESSER 3. We have over 300 positions that are part of that plan. Um, the ESSER funds themselves do sunset. I believe the last one sunsets in September of 2024. Um, we will be back developing um, funding priorities. 
looking for recommendations of what to move on going and what to um, discontinue. We have employee organization noti employee organization negotiations that include compensation, the comparability study, and wage rate analysis. So going forward um, for the special meeting of the board scheduled for August 23rd, we're gonna begin that process using the lens of maintaining fiscal solvency, maintaining and evaluating what we've built over the years, still remaining competitive, building upon what we've already started and contemplating new programs and new initiatives, and then how the 10% cap on reserves plays with all of those interests. And with that, I'll stop and answer any questions you may have. Like to start and call on Mr. Chuck for any questions or comments. I have no questions. Mr. Yang. Thank you for the presentation. There's a tons of information. There are a lot of good ones on here. Um, I would like to just ask you specifically on this uh, item um, slide number nine um, anti-bias education grant program I think it's uh, it's it's good to see this because I think that uh, any students or, or any staff that are experiencing um, any sort of racism, uh, bias in any school, and that will cause a lot of uh, stress. And uh, it's very difficult to learn. So it's good to see that we have this um, in place. And I look forward to see um, how it evolves uh, as time goes on. Um, but there's a lot of things on here, and that's what kind of strikes me. So can you kind of, I guess, share with us if this is something that we could get more uh, funding going forward uh, in the future? So the 75,000 is, is the minimum. So anything um, awarded beyond that would be more, right? It's competitive. So depending on how well we submit our application, we'll determine that. And it also be determined how many districts are applying for it across the state as well. So at a minimum 75, assuming our application is funded, um, but I think it can get up to $200,000. And is this just for point of clarification, is specific just for staff or is it for students or the whole nine yard? I don't know the criteria other than what you see there. Um, this is not embedded in ed code yet. It's just part of the enacted budget. So typically what we see with CDE when they have um, application processes like this one, um, they'll have the, the generic criteria that you see there, but then if there's something specific that they wanna see, or if there's something that they wanna, you know, they wanna make sure that, you know, it, it's kids are being impacted, if you will, um, they may put, you know, you can't do it for this, but you can do it for that. And so they'll normally develop that criteria if there's something, um, and it's usually from an exclusionary perspective where they'll say you can't spend it on this, um, but we don't have enough information at this point to know what that would look like. Thank you. And just for the folks in the, at home, um, you know, this is really kind of add up to our uh, equity programs that we are having. And this is very exciting for me and this whole school district. So thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Albiani, any questions or comments? Thank you very much. I appreciate how transparent we are and informative we are, and um, I appreciate the relationships we have with our with our groups, um, and we know we'll work through all this money and, and find the best way to benefit our students. So um, thank you, and we're excited. This is great. Ms. Tritis Espinoza. Yeah, thank you for a great presentation once again. Um, I have a, I guess a cash flow question with respect to TK staffing. So effective July 1, 
we already had to decrease our TK staffing to 12 to one. And then in April of 2023, um, there will be the census, our P2, and that information will be used to determine how much money we get to support the year that will almost be over, right? So how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have a cash flow issue in our district, meaning we are paid through an advanced principal apportionment. And so the state looks at our prior year ADA information and then we're paid on that up until February, uh, it'll be t February of 23 this year. Okay. Then they look at our P1 ADA snapshot, which is in December and then they adjust it going forward. For our district, it's not an issue. We do receive enough money through the advanced apportionment that it's enough to get us through that by not having this instituted right at the beginning of the school year, it's actually okay. Where we start to have problems with cash flow is when you, they start talking about deferrals and they're not able to pay us on a normal scheduled basis, then it becomes a problem. But the fact that we're gonna move on and we're spending it's not an issue for us at this time. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Mr. Forcina. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions, just one comment. Uh, on slide 16 and 17, uh, it, it's, uh, it's certainly pleasing that the district is estimated to receive $37.5 million for arts, music, and instructional materials. Um, my comment is that um, I hope that we utilize those dollars for art, music, and instructional materials and uh, not for operational costs. I think the legislature gave gave themselves uh, a little out. Um, they weren't brave enough just to support art music, and uh, we we have the opportunity to do just that, and I hope we do. Thanks, Jenna. You're welcome, Mr. Perez. Well, thank you very much. Excellent report as always. <laughs> um, since we're on 16 and 17, what's a, a good operational cost in, for this category or for this pot of money? Because, you know, we, we, we mentioned that we paid 80% on, on uh, um, salary, cost of providing services in our district, but on this project, any recommendations or have you heard? I don't have any recommendations. Uh -huh. I can tell you that coming out of the pandemic uh -huh. and the impact of the amount of students that opted to do independent study um, and the, the students haven't settled yet, right? So some of them stayed with independent study. Some of them are going back to their Transitioning home Transitioning here and there. Sure. So we have, in, in there's instances where we have um, classrooms that aren't full, that we would normally as a district collapse and make be one classroom, but we're leaving them as they are, knowing that kids are gonna go back and forth. No different than with the independent study program, right now we have more teachers than what's technically mathematically necessary, mm -hmm. but we're not going to move those teachers because we want there to be staff. So where pre-pandemic, we would have been a little bit more thoughtful about where classes are and where kiddos are. Trying This time, we're trying not to disrupt the classroom to let kids come back to school. This would be a good funding source to fund those activities that we don't get through the LCFF because the kids aren't here, but we're staffed at a level that's higher. That would be one example. Another example would be the increased cost to the retirement systems. So the district itself has an increased cost per employee um, that continues to go up each year. Um, that would be another um, place where we could use 
an operational cost. I don't know what the intention is of the instructional side of the house. I don't know what the intention is of the Board of Education to know where this would land, which is why um, it'll be back as a plan to be approved. Well, you know, I'm very happy uh, the governor and the legislative body here of California I'm, I'm very happy <laughs> to be in this situation. It's very, uh, it's a good problem to have. <laughs> uh, so, but I, I, I do, as you know, I look at everything with, uh, what's the word? Equity lenses, equity eyes. So I want to make sure that these, these particular funds go to the right sources, schools, and things like that. For instance, uh, number, uh, I think there was number page. Uh, where is that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, page eight. Uh, you mentioned three schools, elementary schools, that were getting funded. Why? Is there any particular reason why we don't know what? We're, what those three schools are right now, elementary, or do you know? Or <laughs> it's, it's still... So I just took a snapshot of our data from 21-22 school year uh -huh. for just grades K through three. Uh -huh. This particular program has the potential of Elk Grove receiving 1.3 million because there are three schools that are in the neighborhood of 97%. So until we start going down and they start allocating monies, uh -huh. um, not sure how we play or don't play, but we have three schools that are close to that 97%. Well, you know, I've been here, what, well, maybe 10, 12 years. Uh, and traditionally, there's a, the same issue, there's a learning loss now and achievement gap. And, and, and I know for a fact that you know, area one and area three, over here, Valley High area, you know, we have a lot of students that are in this predicament. I was wondering why don't we, or why, why we only have three in this, because. Well, I think it's good we only have three. What? <laughs> it is, but <laughs> I think that we need more than right. these. Uh, there are lots of needs out there, yes. Oh, yes I, I would agree with you. Um, there's nothing to preclude Elk Grove Unified for using one of those other sources of funds right. to develop a program that does this activity. Uh -huh. um, that's why we develop plans. So let's just say we weren't close enough to 97%, therefore we didn't get to play with this particular funding source. That's uh -huh. actually a good thing for us uh -huh. because it opens the door for us to be creative. It opens the door for right. us to build a program uh -huh. rather than being forced to have it in a specific configuration. And, so, and, and, and by, I, I seen uh, um, Anna Kurtzke a reading program in practice, and, 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 practice and, and, and they, they, they've done a lot. And I think there's some models at other schools that could be implemented in, in throughout this, this geographic area to improve reading, because reading is the foundation of learning, you know? You need it on every. Mm -hmm. And we also have in our district, um, it was started a number of years ago. I'm gonna call it the wrong thing. Um, it's an on grade level reading program that's run out of curriculum professional learning um, where we set aside one point, I think it's $1.2 million dedicated to just that. Uh -huh. It's to get students in grades K through three up to grade level. Right, right, right. I think that's the program I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Well, again, this is a good problem to have. And again, I'll be looking at, you know, through all the funding sources with equity eyes, lenses, so they call it, I guess. <laughs> and so, um, oh, I was wondering, are you going to have a report by actual schools, how much money they're going to receive by the, these types of monies? Are we going to be able to see that very shortly or? It depends on how the monies are distributed. So if, if the board opts to adopt a plan that says each school is going to get X for this uh -huh. activity, then yes. These monies are not coming to us at the school level, right. they're coming to the district. But yet, I know that they're, they're, they're geared for a certain type of students, that, like the Title I. And, and uh, again, 
And that's going to be a hard job. And you mentioned that how distinguished Title I funding and this money because they're almost duplicating, right? Yes, that's true. Right. They're almost the same objective. And so, so I wonder how you're going to do that or how is administration going to do that? Yeah, it, it's going to be tricky um, to say the least. Very yes. carefully and with uh, input from the board. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. That's it. Ms. Chamerson. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have questions about two areas, about uh, dual enrollment, which I believe is on slide uh, five and six. Uh, on slide six, it says applicants may apply for, and it gives the 250,000 and the 100,000. Um, are we applying for both of those? Are we applying? I know that traditionally from the community college side, what we see is that students that take advantage of dual enrollment tend to be students that are already four year. And so that's why I'm excited about the 100,000 to really help the students that need it. So do we, is that what we're, our plan is for both? Um, I, I can't answer that question, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, it is competitive, so I would assume that we would throw our hat in the ring, but um, I don't know that off the top of my head. Yeah, one of the things we'll have to do, Ms. Chamberson, is working through all of these on the competitive ones is um, make some decisions about which ones we are most aligned with what we're doing currently, so it kind of builds upon, um, mm -hmm. or if there's areas where uh, where we would like to be able to do work where we have them before and now there's there's an opportunity not speaking to dual enrollment specifically, but there may be some others that we say, we don't have the capacity to, to go after that set of dollars because we're concentrating in these other dollars. So that's, that's all work that's gonna need to happen um, over the next several months as we're working through these different parts. Okay, yeah, because like establishing a middle college, like that's a huge undertaking. <laughs> um, and then that was, the, my other concern was if we look at the next, when we look at the priority, um, high priority districts, we don't necessarily fit the bill Agreed. Yeah. for all of those characteristics. So, okay. So that was just for clarification. Mm -hmm. It's not, these are just competitive. We haven't made a decision as to which ones we will be applying for. And as Ms. Hayes said, there may be something that's a good idea that we may not have the student makeup to where we qualify for, but because we have other funding, the board could say, well, we want to do that anyway in, a, in our own own version of it. Um, right. So those are all the kind of conversations that'll, that'll need to happen. Okay, thank you. And then my second question was about the learning recovery um, funds. My question was really just about, are there outcomes attached to that when we report? So if when we get that money, do we have to meet specific benchmarks in terms of that recovery? We did not when we were funded this originally. I don't know if there's been changes. Okay. Um, I don't usually know until they post the the reporting format. And then okay. it's like, okay, now I gotta scramble because I gotta go grab something different. But um, they asked specifically um, how many students um, were served. So if you picked a particular category, they wanted to know how many students that supported or how many schools. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was a direct funded uh, federal ESSER fund, not this particular one, because this is state. Right. So I don't know if they will require that or not at this point. It hasn't been a, um, these funds aren't designed for direct instruction, where it would be a student outcome performance report that would be asked for. They would ask how many students were served, but I don't think they would ask outcomes from that perspective. So that, that wouldn't stop us from developing our own internal pieces that would be would be measurements. And as uh, Mr. Corsina says from time to time, Mr. Uh, Mark Cerruti will be helping. <laughs> <with some of that. laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you, those were all my questions. Thank you. Again, thank you for the presentation. You know, there's a lot of potential here for dual enrollment, um, you know, transitional kindergarten. And I think as you look at the different grants, there might be different criteria as we continue to move forward. So looking forward to having those discussions at the upcoming board workshop about priorities and re-looking at things of what's currently working and ways we might be able to look and, and help um, student data or outcomes base those decisions. So um, again, appreciate the thoroughness. And I know as you get more information on the criteria, you'll be looking through what 
grant specifically apply to us as a district, and that's very helpful. Um, so again, thank you for the presentation. The next item on the agenda is bargaining units, and I'd like to call on Mr. Yank. Madam Chair, we have one blue car. Calling on Diane Campbell. Hello, Board President, Mr. Yang, Board Members, Mr. Hoffman, and Ms. Avalos, and all the Cabinet members. My name is Diane Campbell. I am the President of AFSME Local 258, and I just wanted to say hello and introduce myself once again since we're at the, that new school year. Uh, the fiscal year was started in July, but we're back to school with the, the year rounds and uh, traditionals and Matis coming back. So I just wanted to say hello. Um, I have some of my leadership team here with me, Nick Moran, and Nicole Strange, and Richard Padilla as well. So we are just looking forward to the upcoming year of being able to work together to serve our students, have everybody happy and healthy, work on some staffing issues that everybody is aware about, aware of, um, working with the comparability study and the upcoming neg negotiations. And I just wanted to invite um, each of you, we would love to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. If you wanted to um, come to our executive board meetings or even our general membership meetings, I just wanted to extend that invitation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a date you. Thank you. on those meetings? A date? Yeah, our um, general membership meetings are uh, traditionally the second Tuesday of the month at 5 p.m. We are meeting over at the Gil Albiani Recreation Center over here in the corner. And then our executive board membership meetings are traditionally the fourth Tuesday of the month at 5.30 p.m. at our union office off of Elk Grove Boulevard. So Tuesdays is district days for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. okay, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to call on the next item on Mr. Riley, which is the item number one consideration and public notice of ATU's initial sunshine proposal to the district regarding collective bargaining for 2022-2023. Good evening, President Martinez Lear, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman. Um, pursuant to government code section 3547, the following process is required for negotiations between the bargaining unit and the district. One, the union's initial proposal is officially presented at a public meeting of the governing board for public notice. And two, a public hearing is conducted to receive public input regarding the union's initial proposal. ATU's initial proposal is attached. It is recommended that after the closure of the public hearing, the board take action to officially receive ATU's initial proposal. At this time, I'd like to open the public hearing and call on Ms. Soriano. Are there any Zoom comments for this item? Madam Board President Martinez, there are no public comments on Zoom related to this item. Are there any blue cards, Mr. Yang, for this item? Madam Chair, there is no blue card on this item. I'd like to close the public hearing and call for a motion to receive ATU's initial sunshine proposal to the district regarding collective bargaining for 2022-2023. So moved, Madam Chair. Second. Uh, first by Ms. Chavez Espinoza, second, I think Mr. Perez, <laughs> Mr. Yang. He beat me to it, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> so hey, are you? Mr. Perez, <laughs> I'll conduct a roll call vote, Mr. Track. Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. Forsina? Aye. Ms. Chaitis Espinoza? Aye. Ms. Albiani? She stepped out. Mr. Yang? Aye. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. And myself is an aye. Thank you. Thank you. The next item, two, is public hearing of the Algrove Unified School District's annual service delivery budget plan for special education. And I'd um, like to call here, it says Anne Regali. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Superintendent Hoffman, Ms. Avalos. Um, I respectfully request to open public hearing for anyone who wishes to comment on the Elk Grove Unified School District Annual Service Delivery Budget Plan for Special Education. This item will be presented to the board for adoption at the September 6, 2022 meeting. The rationale for this proposal is the Elk Grove Unified School District Special Education Local Plan Area not agency, it's a common mistake, um, was approved and adopted by the Board of Education on March 1st, 2011. 
Annually, each SELPA is required to develop and revise an annual service budget delivery plan as additional component of their approved local plan. The annual service delivery budget plan includes a description of all the special education services provided by the SELPA, the nature of those services and the physical location of those services. The annual service delivery budget plan also identifies expected expenditures of all items required by the SELPA's service delivery plan. Thank you for your consideration. We'd like to open the public hearing and call on Ms. Soriano to see if there's any Zoom comments related to this item. Madam Board President Marky Michael Leary, there are no public comments on Zoom related to this item. And I'd like to call on Mr. Yang to ask, ask if there's any blue cards to this item. Madam Chair, there's no blue card on this item. At this time, seeing no comments, I would like to close the public hearing and announce that this item will be presented to the board for adoption at the September 6, 2022 board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is item number one, Outgrove Unified School District Community Facilities District 2022-2023 tax report and second reading of ordinance number one for 2022-2023 and Mr. Pierce. Good evening again. Um, this is a follow-up item to the July uh, 19th board meeting and public hearing that you conducted. It's an annual item where the board sets the tax rates for each property and community facility of district number one, in this case for the 2022-2023 tax year. Uh, the ordinance that's before you tonight does include the adoption of the annual tax report and the establishment of the CFD number one tax rates. Uh, the board is acting on behalf of the Elk Grove Unified School District Community Facilities District number one and is asked to adopt the ordinance number one, 2022-2023 and direct administration to deliver the tax report to the Sacramento County Aud um, Auditor's Office no later than August 15th. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. I don't see any questions. So seeing none, at this time, I'd like to call for a motion to approve the 2022-2023 Elk Grove Unified School District Community Facilities District's tax report and adopt ordinance number one. So moved, Madam Chair. And second that. And the first and second, conduct a roll call vote. Mr. Track? Aye. Mr. Fursina? Aye. Ms. Tritis of Venosa? Aye. Ms. Albiani? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. And myself is an aye. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to call on any board member or the superintendent reports. Let's see, superintendent with the hand raised. So just very quickly, thank you, uh, Dr. Martinez Alir. So just want to we uh, we're welcoming back uh, kids and staff. If uh, everyone doesn't know, uh, the summer is officially over in uh, in Elk Grove Unified. It actually ended in uh, July for, uh, for all of us to know. But uh, we did welcome back our um, elementary modified um, traditional and traditional uh, folks yesterday. Got out to a number of sites. Um, great start there. Uh, welcome the the big kids, the the secondary uh, folks um, today. It was out at uh, one of the sites and just a really Really good feel on campus and we'll welcome the eight track uh, teachers back uh, tomorrow so a lot of a lot of early morning uh, welcomes going on great start so far i have been out to all 19 of the year-round sites already and i just want to just give a quick heads up that the additional resources in people and staffing that the board approved through the ESTER plan. They're starting to land and to uh, the feel on the campuses and the appreciation for some of the additional um, staffing on campus is, is greatly appreciated. So just wanna make sure folks are aware of that and just ready for a great 22, 23 school year. So thank you. Any other reports? Seeing none, I'd like to move to the next item on the agenda, consideration of future agenda items. Don't see any hands, seeing none. Um, I would like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting at 7.43 p.m. Thank you.